of my favorite quotes that I actually read a long time ago. I think back at St. John's, back in high school, but it resurfaced this week and I came across it. It's my Nietzsche. Whoever fights monsters should see, should see to it that in the process, he does not become a monster. And when you look long into the abyss, the abyss looks into you. Mm. Wesley Hunt. And I'm Rendon Hunt. And, and you're, you're in, in the, the hunt. hunt. So this is getting to it. We lost what I think is, you know, one of the greatest Americans that we've seen, particularly in my lifetime, this past week. And it's and that's and that's Colin Powell. And, you know, I want to open up talking about this for various reasons. But one, I want to have a conversation about how do we honor someone's legacy, even though we may or may not fully agree with every decision someone has made in their lives or we don't necessarily fully align or believe in everything that they may or may not believe in, but we could still look at the impact that they've had on individuals' lives and recognize in their death their best attributes and how they made a positive contribution to people's lives. And how do we do that in a respectful way and honor someone for their high points and not degrade or demean someone for things you may not like or disagree with. I could not agree with you more. And I also believe that Colin Powell is one of the rarest of Americans. Mm -hmm. We grew up in a household where if you think about black excellence and what that actually means, we weren't watching Michael Jordan, we were watching Colin Powell. So growing up in the 80s, being 80s babies, growing up in the 80s, let's, let's, let's bring people back here to that, to, sure. this, to that time frame. Sure. We grew up in a house to where we learned about Sojourner Truth, and we learned about, you know, obviously, Martin Luther King Jr., but Marcus Garvey and, lead, and black leaders growing up, but they were all dead. <laughs> and when you looked at somebody that was black, that wasn't an athlete, that wasn't a singer, that, was, that had four stars on his or her shoulder, that was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, that was the Secretary of State in a Republican administration in the 80s and in the 90s, and what this person was able to do with his brain and with serving the country and with getting through the Vietnam War in a very contentious time for him to, rate, to rise up in the ranks basically during segregation, because the man was born in 1937, and to be young black men and our parents looking at us and saying, hey, look, you don't have to be able to, you know, run fast and jump high or sing. You could be successful in this country. Look at Colin Powell. Yes. He was the Look example. Look at a man for us. like that. He was the living, by the way, yeah. he was the living example for us. I'll never forget when his autobiography came out. Yeah. And mom and dad bought that. And when you talk about something impactful, Part of the reason why I became a White House fellowship was reading in his book about being a White House fellow and what that meant to him. Mm -hmm. That was something that was implanted in, in me as a elementary schooler, middle schooler. So you talk about the impact that somebody can have on your life. It is fascinating. And I would even go further and say Colin Powell is extremely unique in the level of respect that he commands globally. Yeah. Right. This is an individual, and it's not only respect globally, but respect within this country as well. First of all, whenever anybody dies, and you brought, brought up this a little bit in the very beginning, the time that somebody dies is not a time to go to their lowest points and to kick them while they're down or yeah. to, to kick their supporters down. I think that's so tacky. We do that way too much in their culture. Regardless if you like somebody or didn't like them, the time that they die is not to say, wow, that person was really terrible in X, Y, and Z way. Right. The thing that I find interesting about somebody like Colin Powell, you want to talk about that very important word, respect. This is a man that supported Obama as a Republican 
and was very deep into our invasion of Iraq. And he was somehow forgiven on the right and the left for these things and was held in esteem and respect until the day he died. So I want to, I kind of want to get into that a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So, so this was, this was the post that I made on my campaign social, uh, social media. Sure. I said, it's hard to put into words the impact General Colin Powell had on my life. As a young man, to see a black American reach the highest ranks of military service was an inspiration to me. General Powell's legacy will live in forever in the history of our great nation and the hearts of patriots, uh, and in the hearts of patriots and in me, Wesley Hunt, once a young man who was inspired by this legendary figure and is now a grown man who mourns the loss of an American hero. God bless General Colin Powell. Thank you for your service to our nation. May he rest in peace. Very well said. Okay. And so notice there was nothing political about that statement. No. This had nothing to do with if he supported Obama or if he supported no. Hillary Clinton or anything. No, 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 no. If, uh, th this is about a person that we were able to look up to and quite frankly get to sit here because of men and women yes. just like that. So the problem is this. The problem is this. I make that post, and then there are people that started to attack me <laughs> because, well, he, he, well, he's not a real Republican. He's really this and that. And, and, you know, he supported the Iraq war, and he did this. But like, like, they start going off on these tangents. Say, well, he, was that, he wasn't even a Republican. He wasn't even a conservative. They start going off. And, and if you listen to what I just read, you miss the point on what it was like to be a young black person in the 80s and in the 90s and to watch a successful black man with stars on his shoulders. And conservative ideals. With conservative ideals in a Republican party in the 80s and 90s and what that did as an example for people like us. Wesley, this is what you've heard me say a million times about Barack Obama about seeing a black man in the highest office and what that has meant for a generation of black men to follow on, regardless of what you think about his politics and policy. Brendan? This idea that representation matters, period. Brendan, I'll take it one step further. It's the idea that actually your race doesn't matter. Hmm. Because if he could be the president, Democrat or Republican, what we all know is that requires a majority of white people to vote for said black person. Ooh-wee. Wesley, you... So if he can do it, then why can't I do it regardless of any party? Wesley, the purpose of representation is so that representation won't mean anything. That's the... Po <laughs> Say that again, please. The purpose of representation again. is so that representation won't mean anything. That's the point. We get to a point to where we literally look at somebody's values. Yes. Don't, we don't care what they look like. Yes. We're not going to not vote for them because they're black, or we're not going yes. to vote for them because they're black. We are going to support or not support somebody based on how they align with our ideals. Yes. There has to people be— People like Colin Powell made that possible for people like us. Yes. And this, is, this turns into a bit of a pyramid scheme, right? You have the Colin Powells that are at the top of that pyramid— and the more we can go even further than that, you have the Booker T. Washingtons that are at yeah. the top of that pyramid. Yeah, you get the Frederick Douglasses who are at the top of that pyramid. Yes, and there's an opportunity where, as you continue to go down, you get bigger, you get more and more and more and more people, right? And then it gets to the point where you're no longer saying this person could be the next insert name, but there's just possibility for what the person could be. The endless possibility. I don't have to say that Wesley Hunt could be the next Colin Powell. I get to say that Wesley Hunt can be the first Wesley Hunt. That's the beauty of it. That's where we're trying to get. And all that to say, rest in peace, General Powell. And thank you. And thank you. You've left a lasting legacy on us, on our families, the way that you conducted yourself. Well done. Well done. And you and I have talked about this. Do we agree with every decision? No. No. Do we agree with maybe some of the leanings he had later? No. No. Does that, does that take away what that meant for us to be the only little black kids in our class growing up in elementary school, being the only black kids in middle school at St. John's, one of the few, 
and having an example of somebody that was doing something outside of playing a sport or seeing a song. Wesley, in my room... At, Think about it, Rendon. In my room at, at Mom and Dad's house, I still have... You know, we did the little cut-out pictures yes. where you then write I about know somebody. exactly what you're talking about. Right? And I still have in my room... I did one on Colin Powell. Yep. And this was when I was probably in the third or fourth grade. And the thing that was beautiful about that is not only did I do one on Colin Powell, I felt that I was educating everybody else on somebody who I was very, very proud of. Exactly. Right. And in many ways, when you look at sitting down and doing this and what you're doing right now and the ability to project yourself and, and to tell America a different story and lend different perspectives, the reason why we are inspired to do things like that is because of people like Colin Powell. That's the whole point of the argument. So thank you, thank you, General Powell. And that was the point of the post. Thank you, General Powell. And that's why we're opening up the, the, the show with that. Yes. And, and anybody that wants to start pulling out your your arrows and start start talking trash, you know, about, uh, oh my God, how could you? Because he really wasn't a conservative. This is not political. Nah. Not at this all. is not political at all. This that's, isn't right or left. This is not political. That's pretty good what you did there. I, this is so no, uh, Yeah, I know like fifteen people that you're. It's like the uh, you know the combination of one person I mean? and fifteen. You, you heard. You heard. I could, I could hear the different combinations of people that it was going to be. You heard it. You well, now that, since now that we've got something serious out of the way, you know, yeah. it's it's very difficult for me to joke about Colin Paul. Man, you look good today, man. Hey, you know. What kind of animal had to die for those boots to be created? <laughs> it was a liberal animal. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you what. <laughs> That's that, what I do. That animal definitely identified as a carnivore. <laughs> I can tell you that much. <laughs> now he identifies as a pair of boots. <laughs> yeah, I, can, I, can tell, I can tell you that much. It's a crocodile. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's it's crocodile's belly. It's belly. Oh, is that crocodile belly? Yeah, dog. I thought I thought it was belly. It didn't look as much like crocodile backstrap from it, here. Or head, cu- head cut. There's okay. Belly in there's head. Are those boots okay. a four star admiral now? <laughs> <laughs> it's belly. It, it looked it looked it looked like belly. It's belly. So, interestingly enough, as as things are happening in this world, so I was watching a part of Joe Biden's town hall yesterday. Okay. And I had a friend, we have a friend who, who actually posted on the show and he said something that I will honor. He said, love what you guys are doing, less ad hominem attacks on Joe Biden. Yeah. And I'm going, and, and I'm going to try. This is my buddy, Alan Kaladney. Alan, thank you for listening. I'm, I'm going to try. Yes. After this. Well, we'll take it. <laughs> no, I, I'm going to try. <laughs> no, no. I'm going to try better. Like, I really, I really, and I appreciate that feedback. I actually appreciate the feedback. Yes. And I respect him a lot, too. Yes. So, yes. so that, it, it, that's baked in it. And, so, and, and I respect the feedback. I'm going, I'm going to try, I'm going to try to it's talk. It's hard to do, right, dude? Well, it is. I'm going to try to talk about <laughs> this. It, it's, we're joking a lot, too. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to try to talk about this in a way that doesn't have any ad hominem tax. So, the point at which I stopped watching was when the president was talking about China and our imports from China. And as a Navy man, it's always interesting to think about how if we dominate the seas, what that really means and what that can mean from the standpoint of commerce, defense, and everything that's associated. What so else he, does it mean as a Navy man? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can you get can you can you can you can you, di- can, you can you divorce can you divorce a brother? <laughs> Is that is that like a thing? Oh, you Navy guys! <laughs> is, that, is that like a, a thing? As a Navy as a man, na- as, a, as a Navy man. Uh, so he was talking about the imports that come in to the West Coast of the United States, which, if anybody ever has time to look into it, is fascinating. So basically, forty percent of the imports in our country come through L.A. and Long Beach. Okay. Which is really a problem right now because Long Beach, and then and then I can't remember what the other percentage of, but the Port of Houston also. Port of Houston's huge. It's massive. Yeah, uh, and then obviously the East Coast. But, yeah, but yeah, but, but LA, LA, and if you know, you're thinking almost fifty percent is from LA and Long LA. Beach, which yeah. is which is really fascinating. It makes sense, and it, it makes sense, and especially considering I mean, that's everything that's coming from Asia, right? Yeah. Especially considering um, that China is our number one trade partner. Pacific Ocean. Yeah. Yes, the Pacific. I was a Pacific sailor, if you were. Oh, I bet you were. If you were wondering, a West West Coast sailor. I bet you were. Yeah, it's a West Coast sailor. Uh, so, so we, if you look at all those imports that are coming in, forty percent. Joe Biden was talking about 
policy and basically the fact that we're having a really hard time getting imports right now for a whole host of reasons, uh, and really it's affecting our economy in a for, yes. in, in a very very we're negative in a very, in a very day. negative way. We're seeing it every day. So he's going through, and he's saying. So we have the port of L.A. and the port of, like, uh, 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 why am I here? What am I doing here? And then Anderson Cooper saved him was like, oh, you're talking about Long Beach. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, rag em, frag em, rag em, frag em, Long Beach, right? What am I doing here? Yeah, like, why am I here? What am I? Something to that effect, right? And here's It's really hard for us to, like, not— well, and here's why that's 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 it's it was really a pointed moment for me, because what, what am I doing? Because here? that's when I turned. I it don't off. know. He's, You're the president. <laughs> he said that, and and that's when I turned it off because I was like, what am I doing here? <laughs> why am I watching this? <laughs> like you know, like 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 like. Well, what am I doing here? If he doesn't know what he's doing there, then why am I watching? Then what him? am I doing? Why why am I? I know that you know that I know you don't want me to. Like you know, like like why am I watching you? try to figure out who you're going like, to, I just, it was one of those things, right? Yes. But there was another piece <laughs> in, in this, in the town hall that was interesting where- Why am I here? Why am I here? <laughs> like, why am I here? <laughs> there was another piece in this where he unequivocally supported Taiwan, or said, look, if there is, is Chinese aggression towards Taiwan, mm -hmm. then we will support that. And it was, he gave the right answer. Right? Like, right, like that was the you know, remember when we were in Sunday school where every answer was Jesus. Yes, you didn't know what was going on. Just like, well, what is it? Jesus. Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Good. Answer. That's the right answer. Good. good. It's like family feud. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good answer. <laughs> good answer. <laughs> so he gave the right answer, right? And <laughs> wait, real quick. Speaking of family feud, uh -oh. real quick, real quick. As an aside, this is my favorite family feud question and answer. Are you ready? I'm ready for it. Names that start with the letter. J. John. No, hold on, wait, hold on. Okay. Names that start with the letter J. Brother grabs the mic and goes, Jose. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Harvey goes, Jose with an H. <laughs> <laughs> The best is when. Sorry, that's my uh, thing. Uh, I, I had to. And the best is when all the family members are around and they're like, oh, yeah, that's a good Brendan, one. He said it, and that's what everybody. They started like, good <laughs> answer. <laughs> Jose with an H. Jose's. Oh. Go ahead. Oh, that's a good one. Um, Jose. <laughs> that's bad. That's bad. But but it's it's one of those moments where, you know, you, you see with, with, with Biden and really trying to think about where we are from a policy perspective thinking about where we're going to go. And you know from the very beginning that there's a lot of things that are going to be said that, that you disagree with. But the question is, how are we putting together a cohesive message for the rest of the world when we really can't put together a cohesive message for our own people? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of, a lot of concern there. And, and watching that really was a bit disappointing because what I was getting at a little bit before is, he made this comment about Taiwan, right? Mm -hmm. And after he made this comment about Taiwan, it was the right answer, right? And then the administration pushes back and the press team, they push back and say, well, you know, if, if certain things happen, this really hasn't changed policy. Yeah. Everybody starts doing the moonwalk like, Are you rather, than, rather than letting the right statement stand on its own, yeah. rather than letting the president deliver a good provocative, forceful statement and stepping away from it. Yes. And so once again, there's pieces of this, I will put some of this on, on Joe Biden, I'll put part of it on the fact that there are times when I'm not 100% sure who is making the calls in this country. Mm -hmm. And that is very concerning to me because if he says, we're going to back these people, and then- I was getting ready to make the, an ad hominem attack and I didn't. Thank I just, you. I just wanna, I yeah. just wanna throw yeah. that out there. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Just, just, just throw that out there. And all the Oompa Loompas all of a sudden, Willy Wonka says, hey, guys. <laughs> guys, we're making everlasting gobstoppers. But, 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 Mr. Wonka. But Willy, I, we we want to make chocolate I don't today. Make it, I don't want to make an everlasting. Guys, oh. we're making everlasting gobstoppers. Well, wait, but can we make a chocolate cover? I want to make a swirl. Guys, guys. guys we're making everlasting gobstoppers. Yes, sir. And what's happening in that administration is you have these Oompa Loompas that are coming in and they're saying, 
<laughs> that was a bad word that I was just going to say. Nah, man. Blank Willy Wonka. Nah, dog. We making Twizzlers. And Willy Wonka is saying... Cool, okay, man. I guess we're making Twizzlers. <laughs> Are you cool. willing to walk? Are you yeah. in charge or not? Are you in charge or not? Is this man? your chocolate factory or not? Hey, man, when you're in charge, best thing I learned at West Point. When, when you're, you're in charge, charge be, in, be charge. in charge. Best thing, charge, be in charge. Best thing I learned at West Point. Own it, be in charge. Best thing I learned. Another thing I want to talk about today, and it's it's really in everything that's happened with COVID. One of the things that, as as sports fans, as we've been sports fans for our whole lives, there's always this idea of all the greats have short memories. Mm-hmm. Right. So they're able to do things and whether good, bad or indifferent, they forget what was done before and they push and they charge on to what's hey, next. Man, thank you, man. Thank you for calling me great, dog. I appreciate <laughs> you, that. You do man. have a short memory. <laughs> I got a real short. I've got <laughs> a little too short. Yeah. <laughs> so does Joe Biden. Wesley, Gosh. You just, Wesley, you, you <laughs> see? Gosh. See? Gosh. Gosh. See? I think that's I think that's hilarious. <laughs> Dang it. Um <laughs> but, we tried. We but, tried. Yeah, it's hard. But so, so last last <laughs> week, and we talked about it this little bit on the show last week. <laughs> Sorry. I took I took the family to the Astros game, and that was the the back to back Grand Slams game that was over before it started. Yeah. I mean, literally, it's it's second inning, it's over. You go home. We, what? And the it was I mean, we lost, but we actually well. And, and that's what I want to talk about a little bit is how do you have a short memory? So, so by right? the way, Correa, Bregman, and Altuve have the shortest memory of any trio in baseball. Yes. Those three guys, the, and, and Guriel, and these our our team, like, they're never out of it. No. It could be nine to nothing. Is their, mem- is their like, memory shorter than Huey, Dewey, and Louie? <laughs> <laughs> what about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and Tevet, we go. Remember that? Yeah, I remember that. That's, the church that's, camp. It's a, that's a little church camp humor. Yeah, that's yeah. It's, it's, anyway, it's a, little, it's a, little, a little double J, a little Jesus joke yeah, right there, you know? It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> we, we used to go to church camp. I'll tell you. I mean, you know, this is this is good to know. Otherwise, they'll think that we're just snickering and saying stuff that we don't know what we're talking about. Yeah, we used to go, we used to, go to church So camp. we used to go to church. Church camp was awesome. And we used to run. And, and we've also been Yeah, and we were counselors camp. at church camp as well. And that, might, that might be surprising to some. <laughs> <laughs> we seriously like we're Jesus good. a lot. We're, we're we were good, really yeah, we were good counselors yeah. at church camp, and so they we we always had these little write ups. It was almost like manuals for the camp or agendas for the camp, and they were always trying to be super creative with the wording, right? And it was like this borderline of of creative and corny. Yes, and there's usually, always there's always there's always a borderline between creative and corny. But it was usually, like it was usually like like Cam Newton's attire, right? That's not borderline. There's nothing borderline. Uh, <laughs> Never mind. That's about not, what Cam Newton puts on. That's not borderline. And, and walks out in public. <laughs> so it was, it was always borderline, right? And so one of them, when we would have the little the little booklets, it would have the time that we would go to bed, <laughs> and it would have Shadrach in the sack. And to bed we go. And to bed we go. Yeah. Which now that I say it out loud is not funny at all. It's terrible. Like, <laughs> I, I, I was hoping you wouldn't continue down this road. You, I let you do it, but I was I was trying to give you the. And you should have stopped me. I wish I did. I wish I did. You should have stopped. Now, now we look like big L's. Now I ain't talking about Cool J. <laughs> ah, a little Kanye reference. I like that. I like that. Yeah, yeah. So, anyways, having a short memory, right? So, it's funny that that the Astros. I'm watching that game, and I'm thinking. Not only is this game over, the series is over, right? You start thinking, wow. And now we sit here a week later yeah. being one game away. From the World Series. From the World Series. Uh-huh. We win the night, it's over. And you know what that made me think of, of all things? And partially, whatever you're living through in your life, you always see things through the lens that you're living through, uh-huh. right? And the lens that I'm living through is you and your political life. Yeah. That's the lens that I see things. So I think about where we were last year at this time. Yeah. Yeah. Down and out. This isn't working. Did we make the wrong choices? Did we do this the wrong way? Mm-hmm. And now you got a money gun. Now we got a money gun and we're at game we're at game six trying to go to the World Series, yeah. man. Just like that. Just, Just like, like that. that. 
everything changes, man. Just like that. But it changes when you have that mentality when you have a short memory. Yeah. And you look forward and you, you move on and you learn. You don't lose, you learn. You figure out. Yeah, he got me on that fastball. He ain't give me so give me again. He give me next on his fastball. Not give you me better throw a change up because you know the fastball, it's a wrap. Yeah. And I, and I think that's the approach that we kind of have to have to life each day, day in and day out. Like, you're, you're going to lose. Yeah. You're going to lose. Just, just don't lose twice. Yes. And that's part of the reason, Wesley, why I am so adamantly opposed to cancel culture. Yeah. That, it, that's a good point. That, that is why I'm uh, so adamantly opposed to cancel culture. Because it mutes any of our individual ability yeah. to get better and improve and do better things. We're always trying to drag people back into the past rather than thinking about what they could be capable of in the future. By learning from their mistakes and by talking about it. Yeah. In a certain t- cases, at certain times, joking about it. Yes. That, like, that finding, is Finding the truth in humor and comedy and then being able to grow with it and grow from it. Like Dave Chappelle? I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe. I mean, in, in, the more I follow this Netflix stuff, it gets more and more fascinating. This is what I, that's why I was. That's why I was leading into. I feel like are we brothers? I think we are. I was literally like, like until this divorce goes through. <laughs> <laughs> Not my wife, my di- brother divorce. Like, because yeah, if people well, just tune into one that, that Navy, spot, so like, it's your fault. <laughs> should have signed a prenup. That's irreconcilable. Should have signed a prenup. That's not my fault. <laughs> Uh, I want uh, I want uh, der, uh, child support from you. Uh, der. Der. <laughs> that sounds like you, <laughs> Dave Chappelle. But but the more I watch these Netflix things, the more it gets a uh, or, or what's happening in that in that broader situation and context, the more this gets interesting because essentially you have Dave Chappelle, who part of it is what I think about a lot of the things that we say too, Wesley. We're not hiding behind anything. No. We haven't been hiding behind anything for quite some time. We're 30 some odd episodes in. Anybody who listens to us talk week in and week out probably has a pretty good idea about how we feel about most issues. And I love having listeners who agree with us and I love having listeners who disagree with us. That's what's awesome. Like I would hope that, that we're doing a good enough job in articulating what our perspectives are and maybe how we look at things in a more nuanced way. That's what we're trying to get at, and that's where we're trying to get to. And Dave Chappelle and other comedians are in a world where they try to make light out of, of, of many of the things that are happening in our culture that are very difficult to talk about in a way that's a little bit more lighthearted and palatable. And quite frankly, it will be inherently offensive sometimes because these are things that are very difficult to talk about. But it's offensive because he's making fun of the human condition and human nature. Exactly. It's a it's it's offensive because it's hard to talk about things that we have done or said or where we were culturally and talk about it talk about offensive things and be able to digest it without humor. Yeah. When you add humor, it makes things more digestible. Yeah. It, it allows you to think about things and laugh and 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 have more introspection after you go through the thought. See, if you just, if you just humor get, is emotional Pepto Bismol. It, it it really is, it really is <laughs> like that. It's pretty good. Yeah, thank it, you. It really it soothes it soothes the stomach. <laughs> yeah, soothing yeah. before. Yeah, it, it's 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 one of those things, Brandon, right, where what the, it's the jester, right? Who I mean, I mean, in the king's court, who was always closest to the king? Mm-hmm. It was always the jester. The jester was also usually the smartest and the most intelligent. Yeah, because he had to take into account everything that was happening around sure. the king. And then somehow make light of it in a way to make it more Pepsi bismally. Yeah. To make it more digestible. So that we, we don't get pe- angry. You we just don't use Pepto Bismol as an adjective. Isn't that awesome? That's that's some Cornell stuff yeah, right there. It takes, takes, takes Cornell. It takes a good old. Have you ever heard of it? That's, Cornell? that's some Cornell stuff have right there. Have you heard of Cornell? Makes it a bit more Pepto Bismally. Have you heard of it? That's some Cornell right there. Yeah. yeah. You, like, you like that? Yeah, I like that. I you like that. that. <laughs> yeah, like that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's what I think Dave Chappelle does miraculously. I, yes. I've never, you know, he's he is, in my opinion, and not yours as well, he's clearly the greatest comedian of all time. And, and at this point for me, it's actually not even close. Yeah. And he's able to address, it's not, it's not like fart humor. Yeah. It's not, it's, it's so deep. Yes. 
and so culturally understanding. Yeah. And also, he doesn't discriminate. Mm-mm. Every race of it's, every background of every person of every sexual of every sexual orientation, everybody gets some of the Dave Chappelle smoke. You're not safe, and that's, and, and that's what we've always liked about South Park too. Always what we liked about South Park. So that's what we've always liked about South Park. So that's what we've always liked about South Park. It, South Park is offensive. South Park is offensive equally to everyone. It's hilarious. And we get to laugh about it. It's hilarious. You know, and there's something that we touched on a little bit last week that I really liked, and I I think that. I need to bring this up because there are so many things that are happening in our culture that tear us apart in many different ways. And part of this is the perception of our heroes. Yes. And I think you brought this up really nicely with Colin Powell is the perception of who he is, what he believed. Uh, Hey, everybody, our heroes aren't perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like, like there are, we only in, in, in my school of thought in my belief thought there was only one perfect hero and his name was Jesus Christ. There's only one. Okay. And so our heroes are not perfect. There's only one. And one of the things, I don't know if you've been paying attention to uh, to what's going on with uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg right now and no. Katie Couric. Very interesting. I missed this. So, How did I miss this? I, I don't know. It's, it's a good one, though. Go ahead, yeah. So Katie Couric has recently uh, released a book, I believe, and she was talking about interviewing Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Okay. And essentially they cut a piece of the interview that she had with Ruth Bader Ginsburg to look a different way. And the piece that they cut was her talking about NFL players kneeling for the national anthem. Okay. <laughs> Ruth Bader Ginsburg yes. was pissed about that. Uh-huh. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was basically saying, Hey, this is the country that allowed you guys to be able to play and to be able to fulfill your dreams. And your father and your forefathers were able to do that because of what express, we've been able to. There's better ways to express your discontent. Not even that far. Why are you doing this? Because this country is so great and this is what we've created and this is our oh, national wow. anthem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Katie Keurig was basically talking about how because she was trying to shield RBG from her own supporters, they omitted this from the interview. So it's the idea that there are people on both sides, and and here's here's the- so sad. It is very sad. Here's here's the example, right? It's the whole idea that, okay, you have an R by your name, so you must have a MAGA hat on too and think that everything Trump says and does is right. Or you have a D by your name, which means that you must be a socialist. It just strips out all the potential complexity of people, and it's so irresponsible from a media perspective and from a journalism perspective, yeah. because that prevented us from having better conversations on why she believes that yeah. and why she sees that from that angle, given the seat that she sits in and given the other things that she supported <clears throat> over the course of her career. Definitely. It shows you why somebody is not completely monolithic. And unfortunately, we were robbed of that because the media felt that they needed to curate a story for us. That wasn't true. Cure, needed to. She curated <laughs> a story that wasn't true. Right. And I saw that, and, and I thought that was fascinating. Because it is. And and it goes back really to to one of you know your Colin Kyle, Colin Powell's leadership rules. Right. One of them, and I'm paraphrasing this. He he says something about your your position of authority and your ego. Don't let them get too connected so that once you lose your position of authority, your ego goes with it. Like that whole idea. And it's the same thing, I think, with political ideals and thoughts and ideologies and leaders. Let me tell you what. Like regardless of who the leader is, if a leader comes up or goes down, rises and falls within a party or outside of a party, that doesn't ameliorate me from having to do all I can to make this country a better place. I don't care who's at the top of the ticket. I don't care who's in leadership of any individual political party. We have responsibility in our culture to do better and do right for the next generation, regardless of who's in charge or who's not in charge. One of my favorite quotes that I actually read a long time ago, I think back at St. John's, back in high school, but it resurfaced this week and I came across it. It's by Nietzsche. Whoever fights monsters should see should see to it that in the process he does not become a monster and when you look long into the abyss the abyss looks into you Mm. and 
as we that's a good one Prince Hakeem <laughs> as we look to fight cancel culture I think we're on the side trying to fight cancel culture as we look as the side of trying to fight what wokeness really is and and how do we elucidate people to what really is woke in our opinion and woke does not mean canceling yeah. but but they are becoming synonymous yeah how do we look into cancel culture to try to fight it and then not become the cancel culture we're fighting mm. well that's something that we've said a lot wesley it's this idea of being consistent that's the with pl- with yeah. what because i will be the first to say i mean whether it be a, somebody who has very different views from me i don't think we should cancel anybody that's the point Because I do think it's important, as we talked about with Ted Cruz's podcast at University of Wisconsin-Madison and them muting out his voice because he's a conservative voice. Ridiculous. Let me tell you what, I will be the first to say, A, having served in a Democratic administration and learned so much from the leaders in those administrations, do you know how many speeches I've chosen to go to for people that I knew had very, very different views of the world than I did? Yes. And I chose to go to them because I knew how much I could learn from those individuals. Yeah. And sometimes, you know what I learned? Sometimes I realized that a lot of the stuff that they said wasn't right. Sometimes I learned a lot of stuff that I was saying wasn't right. Yeah, not that much. It's learning. Yeah. Some of it. Small, Very little. Minuscule. Very little. For you. <laughs> a small, <laughs> minuscule portion Maybe grammar. of what I was saying. Maybe I'm thinking grammar. Yeah, but I'm saying. But, ideologically, no. We're, yeah, we're, 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 but I, but, but I, and especially at that age early on and being able to have those conversations and engage with people, that's what's unfortunate is we just are trying to mute that out of culture. And I love that Nietzsche quote and the idea of, of cancel culture and what it becomes. You know, one of the things that, that I've always loved from a quote perspective is, you know, the, the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is apathy. It's apathy. Right. In, or indifference. Yeah. And, it, and it's this, it's this idea that people who are on the extremes in our country are way more alike than they realize. That's the problem. That's the problem. (laughs) They're way more alike than they realize. And I don't know if anybody is like me, the deficiencies that I have as a person irritate me the most when other people have them. Mm -hmm. You could watch me interact with my kids and you, you will know immediately what I'm insecure about in myself. Mm Mm-hmm. Immediately. Is that why you're mad? Because Ryan has a better arm than you already? <laughs> Is that why you're upset? Because he already sw- swings a golf club better than you? <laughs> That's why he's left-handed, man. I noticed he was doing it so well with his right hand. I'm like, oh, yeah, maybe you're left-handed. <laughs> it's still swinging. better. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't work. It backfired on me. <laughs> maybe you're left-handed, right? <laughs> I'll just take us out. Perfect. Right? All right. Well, I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day. Go Astros! At the time that we release this, we'll know whether or not they're going to the World Series or not. So we'll I hope be, we are. We'll be putting on our caps and shirts and, and cheering for them certainly today. And remember, smiles are contagious. So make someone's day. God, God bless, bless you. you. Thank you.